The rest of the time is not true. Chuk, chuk. Hello, hello. Yes. <laughs>
Jesus lives. Jesus lives. Could some of you people that are busy uh, sustaining your lives with some coffee, please come inside and join us? Hello, young Will and family. Good to see you guys back. Those of you that don't know me, I'm JJ, but I'm looking at the faces here. We've got no visitors. Everybody knows who I am. Even, without, even with my beanie on, I can't be incognito. Anyway, it's fantastic to be here together as a church family. Milligan's up there. Good morning, guys. Yeah, it's just, even though it's cold, it's such a beautiful experience to wake up on a Sunday. I don't know about you guys. And, of course, those of us that stand here have been looking forward to this for seven days. But what a pleasure just to wake up on a Sunday morning and know that we can come here and freely worship our Savior and our God. Amen. There are countries around the world where you can't do this, and I think we take it for granted. So I'm just reminding you this morning, don't take it for granted. We are to worship as a church community our Savior who has saved us and our God who loves us and whose grace we live under. And let's remember that this morning as we praise Him with song and with worship. And uh, let's just open today and dedicate this morning, Pete. Let's just dedicate the service to God just through some prayer. So just join us as you're sitting there. Just quiet your hearts. Ah, Heavenly Father, as I've just said, what a, what a wonderful and glorious privilege it is to gather here as your church community and just to praise you and glorify you freely, Lord. And we come and we do that. We open our hearts and our minds this morning. And all we want to do is be in a space with you for the next hour and a bit. And as we sing our songs, Lord, may there be sweet offerings this morning to you. And as we pray this morning, please hear these prayers. Lord, while we were, while we were warming up this morning, we were, we were singing a song called Waymaker. And it just struck me that we stand and we sing these lyrics, but sometimes we don't actually pray them to you. So this morning as a church community, please can we offer these sweet and glorious words of prayer to you this morning, Lord. Lord, we know you here. You're moving in our midst, Lord. You are here. You're working in this place, in this Heronbridge Community Church, Lord. Lord, you are here. You are touching every heart. Lord, you are here. You are healing every heart. Lord, you're turning lives around, and you have turned many around already. Lord, you're here. You're mending every broken heart. Lord, even when we don't see you, we know that you're working. Even when we don't feel you, Lord, we know that you're working. Lord, you never, never stop working. You never stop working working. Lord, you are a way maker. You're a miracle worker. You're a promise keeper. Lord, you are our light in the darkness. Our Lord, that is who you are. That is who you are. Amen. Right, so when we sing that song later, just remember it's a prayer to our God between us and him. So let's sing it with gusto this morning. Raise our hands. Hallelujah. Amen. Those of us that we had our brother, brethren church up there, we've got to get more. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to get a praise worship in here as well. Come and stand next to me and every time I say something, <laughs> praise it back. Oh, it was so exciting. For those of you that missed it, I think we're going to try and organize another day like that. It really was uplifting. It was, it was freedom of worship and praise like I've never experienced in, in my walk of the last 17 years. And if we have that opportunity again, please don't be scared to come there. It's completely safe. It's easy to get there. And the worship experience really was on a completely new and free level. Not that we don't do it yeah, in freedom, but it was just so different there. And I'd invite you all to join us the next time we do that. Anyway, today it's about our service. And uh, the next thing we need to do as a church community, is pray for our family of the week. As you know, we have a family that's uh, chosen every week to, to be prayed for down here openly uh, amongst the family. And then in our home groups during the week, we pray for them again. And then they're on the prayer roster in the prayer group, and they're then on your heart, and you'll just pray for them. 
And it's, it's God ordained that I'm praying this morning for the Rigby's. There's one behind me and one in front of me. Sure. Hope I get through this, guys. <laughs> I had a very small heart. Anyway, let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer. It'll probably be easier for me to just pray rather than talk about them. Heavenly Father, we just, we just stand here and honor this couple and their family, the two girls, Amy and Megan. Just, Lord, they're such stalwarts in this church and in our community. They are lights in the darkness here, Lord. They are salt and light. They are your feet and your hands. They bring such love and such joy to those around them. Lord, they offer grace to everybody. They are the most generous people that people would know. Lord, without them, this church community would be the poorer. We just want to acknowledge you this morning for bringing them into this space and for blessing their lives so that they could be blessings to others. We pray this morning in particular for Pete's health. You can see struggling with his back pain again. Lord, we pray your miracle healing. We pray for... A diagnosis from the medical fraternity for clever people that know these things, Lord. Please touch their hearts, stimulate their minds so that they can get to the bottom of this, Lord. We pray that this morning as a church community. Please hear that, Lord. So, Lord, uh, not enough can be said about this family. As you looking down on them, you know the challenges that they're facing. You know the desires of their hearts. You know what they are trying to achieve and do for people around them and that they already do, Lord. So, please continue to bless them. Let them feel this week uh, your grace. Let it be tangible. Let them feel your love and always know and understand that you are their rock, that you are their fortress, and you are their guiding light, Lord. So we hold them up before you this morning as our family of the week. We trust that you will keep them safe, that you'll continue to bless them. We pray that this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Okay, and that's uh, nearly the end of the JJ show. I've got to go and take up another role quickly, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Gordon. Good morning, Heron Bridge Community Church. Good morning, Heron Bridge Community Church. Morning. That's much better. Guys, I'm feeling cold. Come on, let's warm up this place. Let's all get up and uh, get into a time of uh, worshiping uh, the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Oh, I like that. Hallelujah. Sweet. Come on, that's what we need. <laughs> I missed that last week. <laughs> Church, the song we're going to sing is a Glorious Day. Hallelujah. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tool Till I met you I was breathing but not It was my dream Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your freedom is 
all that I know. My sin was heavy, my chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, and you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Take your seats. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I'm going to stand here and do it because uh, we'll be going from a from a prayer into a song of prayer and a, and a session of prayerful songs. So again, it's my privilege this morning to to do the prayer for the unsaved people and to give thanks for the tithes and the offerings. Phew. How exciting is that song to sing with gusto? Gusto. <laughs> right, this morning uh, we're doing another unreached uh, people group, and there are many, and every time I do this, and every time somebody else stands here and prays for the unreached people, I am reminded that it's not that many generations ago some of our forefathers came to this country to save people like us. And without those missionaries that went around the world uh, four and five hundred years ago and longer, Christianity may never have reached us down at the southern tip of Africa. So it's wise that we look at these communities and understand who they are and what their challenges are and just bring it before our Lord and ask him to send people to places like this to raise people up that are already there and just to ask for Christianity to spread to all four corners of the globe. So this morning we're praying for the, the Balinese people, They're the unreached people group that we're praying for this morning. They're from Indonesia. There are 4.2 million people in this particular region, as you can see on the map there. And there are fewer than only 10,000 Christians. But as we know, our God is a God of miracles, and he can take that little spark, that little mustard seed, and create a wave of Christianity there. There are some challenges. They live in our, um, they live on an island, as you can see, and most of them live in very close-knit villages with strong family and social and religious and economic interrelationships. So it's a tight-knit community, and it makes it very challenging to turn to our. Christian spiritual beliefs and to show them a different way. 
Hinduism is the primary religion. And they've maintained the original culture. Um, so Balinese Hinduism differs slightly from uh, Indian Hinduism. But we just pray this morning that uh, our God will raise those 10,000 people up, set a spark, set a flame going, as we've heard before. So please join me in prayer. I'm going to pray for the unreached group, and then I'm also going to pray for the offering, and I'll close off. So please just, as you're sitting there, let's just pray for these two items. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're in this room today. You know already what we were going to be showing and speaking about. We just pray that you'll hear this prayer, that you'll hear our plea and our cry, Lord, that you will raise missionaries up from around the world, somebody who will hear that there are 10,000 Christians, perhaps not even allowed to worship freely on Sundays or any day of the week, Lord, that you'll just give somebody the courage to go to this community, Lord, and, and set it aflame to take the gospel, to show them the light. And Lord, just, just hear our prayer this morning, Lord. Just We call to go and uh, make disciples. We pray this morning for somebody to, to put up their hand and say, pick me. So we pray this morning, Lord, for the Christian Balinese community. We pray that they will grow from strength to strength and that uh, many lives will be touched and reached. So thank you for hearing this prayer for these uh, unreached people this morning, Lord. Thank you. And then, Lord, we're also so grateful and joyous as a time of prayer. It's a joy to be able to uh, give back. All we get is from you anyway. And uh, just part of worship and part of joy just to to honor a portion of what we have and give it back to you, Lord. So we just pray that these offerings that we give today in this, uh, in this space and for those of us that, uh, that provide electronically and by other means, Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to bless what is given, multiply it, so that we can be a, a community church that reaches communities that can see the effect of your grace and your love in our lives, Lord, so that we can make a difference. So thank you, Lord, for every single person, no matter how big or how small, for every single person that gives with joy and freely, Lord. Please bless what they do, make it more abundant, and uh, Lord, we just pray for wisdom in how we spend it. We pray that we would be good stewards of your property, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for hearing both these prayers this morning. We really pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you that have brought something to put in the bowls, uh, Paul, uh, and maybe one other, somebody kind, there we go. We'll just pass them around. And then for uh, electronic giving, you can get it on the website, or if you want to, just take a quick snap of that with your smartphone. Yeah, if you can't give on a Sunday morning, then please just give any time that you feel the compulsion. Uh, the church operates on the money that we give back. That wasn't ours to start with. So thank you. We're going to go back into a time of worship now. Over to you, Gordon. Church, let's stand together as we continue worship.
Father, we just, we raise a hallelujah up to you, and we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people, and that as we worship you and as we praise you, you are right here with us in our midst. And Father, we pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would just lead us and guide us as we worship you and speak into our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We just continue to praise you today, Lord Jesus. Your name is forever, your kingdom shall come down, and your will be done. You are a provider, you know what we needed. Forgive us our failures, as we will forgive. We pray for open heaven.
Thank you for your love, your unconditional love. We just praise you, Lord. Lord, words are too few. Just uh, hear the heartbeats. Just hear our thoughts, Lord. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross to forgive our sins. Thank you for access directly to your love and to your grace, Lord, that we experience and live with every single day. We just acknowledge you this morning. We thank you for that. Amen.
Awesome God, waymaker, miracle keeper, promise keeper. And we just praise you, Lord Jesus, that we can come before you this morning with our problems and our concerns, our brokenness in a broken world, and we can worship you and we can sing confidently of these things because you are a good, good God. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Please take your seats. Thank you so much to Gordon and the team for leading us in worship. Um, JJ <clears throat> alluded to, to last week's service uh, in Depsluit. Uh, Trish put together a short little video clip to so you can see what you missed out on. Let's take a look. Build your
Let's welcome our pastor. The name of Jesus. Mighty Jesus. Pastor Harry, you're welcome on the stage. Okay, it looks like a, a wonderful time was had by all. Thank you so much to those of you who went. Um, I think, you know, JJ says it all. I think, you know, it's a, a, I think for many it was an interesting cross-cultural experience. Maybe not everybody's cup of tea, but the wonderful thing is that there are so many ways to express worship to our God because He is so rich and diverse. And I don't know if you noticed, for me the thing that stood out is all the smiles. Uh, everybody's smiling. You can only but have fun when you're all jiving together before the Lord. Anyway, I'm going to invite the kids uh, to go out to Sunday school and the youth. Actually, I don't know. I haven't seen Daniel this morning. I know Sishle is not here this morning. Um, Daniel, are you here? If not, then I think the youth must stay in those who are here. <clears throat> From me, a very, very warm welcome. Um, it's nice to be back in our hall, isn't it? It's been, two, it's been three weeks since, uh, since we haven't been here. And uh, nice to have curtains again. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to be back in our, in our spiritual home. So, friends, um, the question, why? Probably the most asked question in the world. Why? And for those of you who have raised children, I'm sure you recall those conversations where everything you say is met with a response, why? And eventually, as parents, you all get to the point where the response is uh, the standard, because I said so. But even as adults, that question comes to our lips more as a cry of protest than an actual question. Why? Why, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous suffer? Why do the wicked prosper? Why is there so much hurt and suffering and anger in the world? Why is there so much poverty? Why does the mother of young children get cancer and die? Why do we have so much corruption in our beautiful country? Why so much crime? Why do we struggle? Why, Lord? And how long, Lord, will you tolerate these things? Friends, starting today and over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. So before we dive in, let's get a bit of background and historical context. The Old Testament consists of 39 books, and 12 of those are the so-called minor prophets. And they're called minor not because they are less important than the others, but because they are shorter in length than the major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And of the 12 minor prophets, we know the least about this one, a man called Habakkuk. In fact, we don't know much about him as a person at all. He was probably a temple musician, and at some point, God started speaking to him in visions, and so he became a prophet, a man who relayed to the people that which God was revealing to him. The word Habakkuk in Hebrew means to embrace, and uh, it's no small chance that you know, it becomes clear as we move through this, Habakkuk, uh, this book of Habakkuk, we see that Habakkuk does embrace the message of God and accepts what is to come. And God, in turn, embraces Habakkuk's questioning and in so embraces him. And there are powerful lessons that we can glean 
from this mutual embracing. Three weeks ago, <clears throat> I preached on the cleansing of the temple by King Hezekiah. And if you recall, I mentioned that contrary to God's plan, the Israelites wanted a king to reign and to rule over them. They weren't happy with the theocracy. They weren't happy with God being their ruler. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like the nations around them who also had kings. And it's actually quite sad because God's purpose for Israel was for them to be holy, to be set apart, to be different to the nations around them. And although rule by a king, a human king, was not God's initial plan for them, he did relent and he appointed Saul as their first king. And a mere four kings later, things had gotten so bad that the kingdom was split. The kingdom of Israel was split into two rival states, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And each state was ruled by a success of kings. And we see a pattern emerging where some kings are good and are pleasing in the eyes of the Lord and others are bad. And we also see that through the time, God was constantly raising up prophets to warn the nation, to encourage them and to warn them to stay on the right path, to stay on the straight and narrow, especially during the reigns of the bad kings who would pull the people away from God. And one of these bad kings was a fellow called Jehoiakim. And he reigned from 609 B.C. to about 598 B.C., so 11 years of his reign. And 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 37 tells us in no uncertain terms that Jehoiakim did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Under his reign, he actively promoted idolatry. He imposed heavy, heavy taxes on his people and forced labor on them to build uh, his, or to fund his building projects, including a very, very lavish palace that he built for himself. The prophet Jeremiah, one of the prophets, one of the major prophets, uh, he prophesied as well during the reign of Jehoiakim. And look what's, what God says about Jehoiakim through Jeremiah, the prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 13. And the Lord says, What sorrow awaits Jehoiakim, who builds his palace with forced labor? He builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors or his countrymen, his people, work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows. I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it a lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king. And in verse 17, you have eyes only for greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent, oppress the poor, and reign ruthlessly. Not too good to hear God saying that about you. So Jeremiah was the prophet who, who issued these warnings to, Jehoi to, to Jehoiakim, but he rejected the warnings of Jeremiah. In fact, when Jeremiah's scroll, which contained prophecies of doom uh, against Judah, when that was read to Jehoiakim, he cut the scroll into pieces and he burnt it. That's what he thought of God's message to him. Another prophet who lived at that time was a man called Uriah. And Uriah prophesied that Jerusalem would fall. And so Jehoiakim sent assassins to kill him. Under Jehoiakim's reign, Judah experienced radical moral decline. The prophets and the priesthood were corrupted with adultery and abuse of authority. And it was also a time of incredible political upheaval in the region. There was a lot of political tension between Egypt and Babylon. And Judah was pulled into that upheaval and into that tension. And the Israelites felt uh, the effects of that turmoil and tension in the region at that time. So it's not an exaggeration to say that Judah was a mess. It was an absolute mess. It was a seething cauldron of violence. People were killing each other. There was treachery, idolatry, false religion, social injustice. The poor were being trampled. 
the rich and the powerful were taking farms and houses and the possessions of the poor. And the poor had no recourse uh, to the courts because the courts were corrupt and judges were bribed. The whole legal system was paralyzed. And all of this because King Jehoiakim and his leaders, his co-leaders, Judah's leaders, were corrupt and wicked and evil people. And so it was during this time, under the reign of Jehoiakim, that Habakkuk also prophesied. All right, that by way of background, let's turn now to Habakkuk chapter 1. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and I want to encourage you guys, if you have a device that's got different translations, or if you've got different translations at home, um, reading the prophets sometimes can be a little bit dry um, and a little bit difficult. But the New Living Translation, actually, the way it's translated makes it a bit easier, I find personally, to read uh, the prophets. It's more uh, contemporary in the language and the wording used. So I'm using the New Living Translation uh, as we work through Habakkuk. Uh, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. The anguished cry of a man facing and living in a terrible situation. And friends, does it not sound like he wrote this yesterday in South Africa? Not 2,600 years ago in Judah. Why, Lord? How long, Lord? Where are you, Lord? Well, we see that the book starts <clears throat> in verse 1 by telling us that what is to follow is a message that Habakkuk received from God in a vision. But then instead of actually receiving a vision, Habakkuk starts with a lament, asking God why and how long there must be injustice and hardship. And friends, this suggests that this questioning by Habakkuk, these very direct and, and difficult questions to God, is inspired by the Spirit of God. In other words, his asking of difficult questions of God is part of what he received from God. It is a God-inspired lament. It's not a sulky, petulant complaint. And as such, it serves as a model for us. And we'll come to that in a moment. And because Habakkuk starts by asking God tough questions, his message, his prophecy is different from any other prophetic book in the Bible. Because usually a prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God. Thus saith the Lord. Here, on the other hand, in Habakkuk, we have a, a conversation recorded for us, a conversation between Habak Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk has questions about what is going on in his world, and he'd like God to step up and give him some answers. In verse 2, we see that Habakkuk starts by asking God how long he must wait for God's help. There is violence around him, and he is crying out for help, but it appears as if God is AWOL. He's gone. It seems as if God is not hearing his calls for help. God is not coming to save the faithful in Judah from the evil they are facing and experiencing daily. And in verse 3, Habakkuk lists six specific issues that he and the people of the time are facing. And the New Living Translation translates them as evil deeds, misery, destruction, violence, arguing, and fighting. And in the original Hebrew, Habakkuk addresses these six problems in, in, in matched pairs of two. The first two, evil deeds and misery, well, really two sides of the same coin. The evil deeds of the perpetrators 
is leading to the misery of their victims. Habakkuk wants to know why God tolerates this. The third and fourth problems are also a pair, destruction and violence. Destruction leads to the loss of infrastructure, and violence speaks of physical injury and loss of life. And together, destruction and violence wreak havoc on any community anywhere in the world, causing psychological trauma, the breakdown of social order, and the fabric of society. And so Habakkuk wants to know, how long, God, God must I call for help? Where are you, and why don't you come to save? The last pair of problems are arguing and fighting. And in the original Hebrew, these are actually legal terms. Habakkuk says that he is surrounded by people who argue and fight and litigate, indicating that there are many lawsuits and litigation and legal quarrels in Judah's courts. And then in verse 4, Habakkuk indicates that these six problems have led to four situations that are even more terrible, again in pairs. The law is paralyzed, and justice does not prevail. And the wicked outnumber the righteous so that justice is perverted. The courts no longer work, and there is no recourse for those who are suffering. And so, friends, what Habakkuk is, is conveying in a few brief words, in, in three verses, is a society full of crime and violence and corruption and pointless legal battles and the defeat of the righteousness. Under Jehoiakim's rule, Jerusalem has become a failed government, a government which favors the rich and the politically connect, connected, and as a result of which, life has become unbearable for the ordinary man in the street. Society is ruined, and the prophet wants to know why on earth is God allowing this to happen? Where are you, Lord, in the face of all of this? And friends, as we look around us, I think we can, to some degree, relate to this. As a nation, we've come through roughly 14 years of disastrous political leadership that has resulted in these things, these very things that Habakkuk is lamenting. A society riddled with crime and violence and corruption, pointless legal, costly legal battles, a breakdown of society, a destruction of infrastructure, a perversion of justice, a limping legal system, a breakdown of morals, and ultimately increased hardship for the poorest of the poor. Just this past week, if you follow the news, the former judge president of the Western Cape, a man called John Schlope, who was found by the Judicial Services Council earlier this year, was found to be unfit to be a judge because he's such a rubbish. And he's the first judge in this country who was ever kicked out of, from the bench, removed from the bench. Just this past week, he was appointed by the MK party to sit on the Judicial Services Council. A man who has been deemed to be unfit to be a judge now sits on the very council that determines the fitness of judges. Talk about a paralyzing of the law and a perversion of justice. And this was allowed by the majority of our government of national unity. They have placed in a position of power a man who lacks integrity, honesty, and moral scruples. And we've heard politicians this past week justifying this decision and not speaking out against what is clearly and blatantly wrong and the perversion of justice. Now, I apologize for getting political, but I've said it before, friends, politics and religion cannot be separated. Because why? Because politics will always impact the world in a way that calls religion to respond in some way. And we saw this in Revelation. 
dragon-influenced and dragon-manipulated political power is the beast from the sea that rises up to wage war against God's people on behalf of Satan. And this is what Habakkuk faced. This is what the New Testament church faced. This is what John's congregations in the seven churches of Asia Minor faced. Friends, this is what we face. And so, facing this breakdown of society, Habakkuk turns to God. And he cries out, why and how long? And he pleads with God for justice. And friends, this plea for justice is, is one that God has pre previously promised to hear. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning. Exodus chapter 22. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. In other words, those who are, are, are least in society, those who struggle the most. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. See, there is clear biblical precedent that God hears the cries of his children. And Habakkuk has an expectation that God will respond. And so he cries out to God, fully expecting God to hear his cry and to respond to it. So what can we take away from these first four verses of Habakkuk? Well, friends, the reality is that bad things happen even to those who are followers of God. And, and, some, and in some countries, in some instances, especially because they are followers of God. But friends, the reality is when, when we have bad rulers, everyone suffers. When calamity and disaster strike, it affects everyone. You know, it's not as if God's people are spared from these things because they happen to be God's people. And the Bible shows us that it's okay to cry out to God and to pour out our hearts to him when we struggle and when we suffer. You see, it's not a sign of weak faith to ask God why. It's not a sign of weak faith to say, Lord, how long will you put up with this? Where are you? Actually, questioning God can be good for our spiritual lives. And Habakkuk teaches us that there is a faithful way to question, a way to have doubts and even to challenge God while still remaining faithful. Friends, just like Habakkuk, we can ask for God's attention and express our confusion when we cannot comprehend his ways. Habakkuk teaches us a few things about when we have questions. First of all, he teaches us that God can handle our honesty. God knows what's going on in our hearts anyway. So when we speak to him about what's in our hearts, he's not taken by surprise. And I promise you, he's not offended. We can come to God with our honest questions and doubts. It doesn't threaten him. God is more than able and capable to handle our honesty. And friends, the Psalms illustrate that beautifully for us. You know that roughly one-third of the Psalms are prayers and songs of lament. We regularly see the psalmist pouring out his heart to God. And there is intimacy in the lament and those hard questions asked. So too, the books of Job and Lamentations are, are dedicated to expressing the confusion and pain of unbearable suffering by God's faithful followers. Even Jesus, you know, Hebrews 12 uh, tells us that Jesus, for, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. But when he was hanging on the cross, he lamented and he cried out to the Father using the words from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Friends, what, what Jesus and the Psalms and Job and Lamentations and Habakkuk model for us is that part of your journey and my journey as believers is honest dialogue with God. It's okay to be honest with God about our struggles and our situations. It's okay to lament 
without guilt. It's okay to ask God the hard questions, the why questions. In fact, honest dialogue with God flows from an intimate relationship with Him. And the closer our relationship with God, the more honest we can be with Him. We don't have to come to God only when we're happy, only when we're grateful, only when things are working out okay, and only when we have everything figured out. We can also come to God in our confusion, our unhappiness, our pain, our anger, our brokenness. Even our doubts and our questions can be acts of worship because they reveal that we trust in the goodness of God. And that leads me to the second thing Habakkuk teaches us about when we have questions, and that is our questions take God seriously. You see, Habakkuk's questions were based on the underlying assumption, the understanding, the premise that God is a good God and that God is good all the time and that God cannot tolerate evil. That's why Habakkuk's asking these questions. It reflects his attitude and understanding of God as a good, good God. Friends, in Habakkuk's questions were in a way statements of faith in God. When we question God as Habakkuk did, we are asking why he doesn't act in a way that's consistent with whom we believe him to be. And so our questions are actually statements of faith and trust in disguise. And that's why Habakkuk's protest, his lament, is faithful. It's faithful because it's all about who God is. It's done, his lament and his questioning is done out of the conviction that God is good all the time. If we didn't think that God was a good God who hated injustice, then we would not bother to ask him why he tolerates it. And that is also why there is a difference between faithful protest an unfaithful protest. Faithful protest flows from a relationship with God and the conviction that God is a good, good God all the time, even, even in death and dying. God is a good, good God. It's a personal address of anguish to God. Lord, why would you allow? Or Lord, why? Unfaithful protest, on the hand, other hand, is that which does not flow from a relationship with God and which seeks to judge and blame Him. It's the impersonal. How could a loving God, or why would your God? And I think we've all heard the cynical and mocking questions of those who wish to disprove the existence of God by asking those questions. It's not the same as the faithful believers lament or protest or questioning. And the third thing that Habakkuk teaches us <clears throat> when we have questions is that our questions drive us to God. You see, Habakkuk is not asking questions about God. He's asking questions of God. Questioning and having doubts can actually strengthen our faith because they lead us to earnestly seek answers. And so they strengthen our faith. They are motivated by the challenge or the desire to understand why, to understand the heart of God more. And this may sound weird, but we actually need people who doubt. It sounds weird, doesn't it? We, we need people who doubt. You see, people who doubt, in a sense, are, are a gift to us. Without them... Without people asking these hard questions, our faith risks becoming glib. We need not settle for easy answers or feel threatened by our questions. It's when we wrestle with the tough questions of our faith that we draw closer to God. And friends, the, the tougher the questions and the harder it is to understand the why, the more we have to put our trust in God. The more elusive the answers, the stronger our faith has to be in saying, we don't know why, we don't understand, but God does know, and he is sovereign, and we trust him because we know he's got this. 
even if we have to say why, Lord, and even if we don't get answers. When we get to chapter 2, verse 4, we will see that God says to Habakkuk that the righteous live by faith. Despite the questions, despite not having the answers, the righteous live by faith. And that is really the overall theme of the book. And so, in an ironic twist, our questions and even our doubts serve to strengthen our faith. Friends, I don't know what questions and, and what doubts you have this morning. But the Bible has a book that teaches us to take our questions and our doubts seriously. It encourages us to have honest conversations with God about these issues and to bring them before Him honestly and openly. And when we're confused and have questions and when life doesn't make sense, let's not forget that God has done everything to prove His love for us so that we can remain faithful to Him. When, when the mess of the world we're living in, when the suffering and the hardship doesn't make sense, when we wonder why God doesn't do something, why he doesn't intervene supernaturally, then we need to look to the cross as the eternal and enduring monument of God's love and of God's mercy. God has not, he has not promised to give us all the answers but he has given us the cross as the answer of his love in spite of life's confusions and questions. So we can ask God, we can come before him, we can lament, we can cry out before him, knowing that he loves us and knowing that the cross stands there as a reminder of his love. Next week we'll look at God's response to these questions, we'll see his answer, and we'll see that we will not always like the answers that God gives. That's next week. Let's pray now. Yeah, Lord, sometimes it feels like it's kind of irreverent and, and improper and lacking in faith when we ask you these questions, when, when we look at the world around us and we see the the bad things, and we want to ask you why. And Lord, thank you for the reminder in, in the book of Habakkuk that the right questions prompted by the right heart and attitude are actually from you. And Lord, help us to be honest with you. Help us not to try and be pious uh, with a false piety where we try and cover what's in our hearts. And Lord, I just pray for every single one of us that our relationships with you would, would deepen day by day, that we can have these honest and difficult questions before you and the hard questions. And Lord, thank you that you are a big God. You're a good God. You're not offended. And Lord, thank you that even in the questioning and even in the, the crying out, the why, the lament, how long, Lord, even in these things, you are growing us, you are stretching us, and you are increasing our faith. And so, Lord, help us to, to be people who are honest with you. Help us to bring our questions from a point of faithfulness. And, uh, yeah, Lord, as we do that, we ask that you would continue to strengthen us. And, Lord, we live in a, in a, in a difficult world. We live in a, in a difficult country. And it's so easy to become despondent and to become downcast, as no doubt Habakkuk was. But Lord, help us to remember that in the midst of all of this, you are still God, you reign supreme, and you are with us, and you will be with us to the very end of the age. And so we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, take a moment to reflect. Just think about that. If there are any hard questions you have in your heart, um, to ask the Lord. It's okay. Um, bring them to him now, and then in a minute or two, uh, Gordon and the team will lead us in closing song. Thanks.
Church, let's stand together for our closing song. Amen. Please take your seats. Uh, friends, I've got one announcement before I re release you to go and soak up the warmth outside and have a cup of coffee and a cookie. Um, and that is um, the church's annual general meeting is happening next Sunday. 
Um, it's an important meeting. We're required to do it by our constitution, but it's also just a good time to kind of look back and reflect on what the God and what the Lord has been doing in our church over the past year. So that's next Sunday, immediately after the service. Um, these meetings are normally quite quick, 10, 15 minutes, so it's not going to take up a lot of your time. Um, but please be here, and especially if you are a member of the church, we need you if there are any items that need to be voted on. But we also need you here to be it. Uh, it's not considered to be a, a meeting, a, a formally or a properly constituted meeting if we do not have a quorum. So if you cannot be here next week, we need your proxy. That is um, giving your proxy to another person to say, I'm here representing Frick, who couldn't be here today. So um, there are forms outside. I, I, do we don't have any Fricks in the church, do we? No. Anyway, you know what I mean, hey? Um, there are forms outside, proxy forms, which you can fill in. So you can choose Brian or myself or anybody who, who you know is going to be here to be your proxy. And uh, if you don't do that online, there are online proxy forms as well. And also part of the AGM every year, the annual general meeting, is just our annual report. And that is ready. Um, I want to encourage you, go onto the website. The church's um, annual report is there. Go and read it um, and rejoice at what God is doing and has been doing in this church over the past year. So that's next week. Uh, very important. Please so look for those details on the website. Uh, and all the other details and announcements and important news of the church is on there as well. So I want to encourage you, keep up with what's happening in the life of the church through our social media. But otherwise, now go and warm up and have a good cup of coffee and tea. And God bless you. See you next week. Cheers.